Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the uh, offer to come by and, and talk about what we do um, in our company. And uh, I work for uh, VTX1. It's actually several companies. And, um, you know, I've got the marketing slogan up there, we've got you covered. I didn't come up with that, but anyway, they did. So it's kind of interesting. But basically, um, we build networks and uh, from very low tech to very high tech networks very leading edge stuff or a small company that's headquartered in Raymondville, Texas. And uh, you might be surprised what we do and what we have done, um, especially in the last 10 years. It's, it's pretty amazing some of the technology, some of the things going on. I've been doing this a long time. And uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, we have um, quite a few offices. I actually have some people that work in the Chase building. Um, here in McAllen, uh, one of, some of my team members work there, uh, especially on the um, network security and the ISP side. Uh, we have an ISP, so I have some people that work there. I also have people that work in San Antonio and other places too. So we're kind of all spread all, all over South Texas. You might not have never heard about us, but uh, hopefully uh, I'll educate you a little bit today and uh, hopefully you'll pick up the water bottles. I'm not taking them back. So. <laughs> Um, and I will make uh, uh, one thing that's very interesting, the AT&T's LTE network here is very good. Uh, we did some bandwidth tests and it's a very, very strong network here uh, compared to other parts of the valley. And that's a, it's not the first time I've done that, I've done uh, that on several occasions and you get some very good throughput here in this region in Edinburgh uh, compared to other parts of the valley. So if you're on AT&T, LTE, then that's a good thing. If you're not, well, you probably have other issues. But anyway, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our company. Like I said, first an introduction of myself. Um, I um, have an undergrad degree in mathematics, uh, graduate degree in electrical engineering, and don't pick on the engineers. Um, but the electrical engineering is actually especially in telecommunications and data communications. And um, there's not too many colleges in the United States that do that. Uh, but that's kind of where my core is, um, what I've done for my entire career. Um, I oversee all our technology in our company. Um, we have a, um, our entry level positions in our company are our help desk technicians. We consider those people entry level. Um, the basic stuff, uh, Renee talked about all the skills that you need to be a help desk technician. Uh, we support uh, all our customers, whether they're voice customers, uh, data customers, whether they're, um, they, we finally got rid of our dial-up customers, finally. Convinced marketing to cut them off, but anyway, that's another story. Um, anything from uh, various flavors of DSL all the way up to fiber to the home. We also have a, a fixed wireless product also uh, for data. And they support that, and they also support our video products, so we have a video product. I'll talk a little bit about that. So that's our entry level, and then from there, a lot of our help desk technicians, they move up under our company. And we have uh, openings all the time. Actually, we have two, two openings right now, currently opening, uh, job openings in uh, Raymondville. So we're looking for a couple people, one in our engineering organization, and another one in our uh, a network tech in our central office location and both those uh, jobs are in Raymondville. It's a good company to work for. We have great benefits. Um, benefits uh, 100% the day you're hired. Not too many companies do that. We have 401k and stuff like that. So um, I've worked in the industry a long time, so it's a good company to work for most of the time. I'll be honest with you. you know, we have our problems like anybody else. Uh, so I'm, I'm over all that, the IT group, the Network Operations Center, um, we have a network operations center that's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, including hurricanes. When we have hurricanes, we sleep in the knock, in the tandem. I've slept in the cot there on many occasions during hurricanes. We need to keep our networks up. Um, our networks are protected by generators or everything. We have over 300 sites that we manage and maintain in South Texas. Uh, buildings, remotes, and stuff like that. I've been doing this since 1976. My first personal computer, since I was talked about earlier, was not color, had 4K of RAM, <laughs> and we programmed in binary code, not even an assembly language, ones and zeros. So anyway, it's been a long time ago, so uh, it was actually one color with a black screen. 
Um, been doing this since 1976, so started at uh, AT&T Southwestern Bell. Also um, taught college as an adjunct for about 15 years. Taught college uh, full time for about five years. Uh, also taught a little bit at Univers University of Phoenix online. Uh, really didn't like that. I liked the, the classroom environment a little bit more, although the technology has improved a lot today. So I've been doing this a long time. I really enjoy it. And uh, most of my career was spent in San Antonio, but I've been in uh, South Texas in the Valley since 2005. We'll talk about a little bit what's happened since then. Okay. Um, Networking, okay, so how important is networking today? How many people depend on networks for everything? It seems like everything, right? I mean, you work in technology, you want networking, you want bandwidth. It, never, it seems like you never have enough bandwidth, right? And you want it, what, available everywhere. You want it wirelessly, you know, at home, at business, at work. You're always looking for a connection to the network. Well, that's, that's kind of the stuff we do, and that's where we fit in. Um, there's always a lot of talk about, um, you know, having wide-scale networks and being a commodity in the United States and the world and things like that. Um, we've come a long way in the industry, um, but there's, because of that, the, the demand for networking and bandwidth is, is even more than it used to be. I mean, it's just amazing what's happened in the last 10 years. We had the big boom. I don't know, the dot-com crash, you know, early 2000s, stuff like that, and things kind of settled down for a little bit, and then, bam, the last 10 years is just, it's just like, it's, it's mushroomed. And the, uh, the demand for networking and bandwidth is just ever-increasing. It, it just never seems like it's enough. And we have, we have people that, you know, in their 80s that want high-speed networking, they want fiber to home. Imagine that. You know, it's like your grandparents, your great-grandparents that want fiber to home. Pretty crazy stuff. Okay, so uh, let's see where we're at here. Okay, let's talk, I'm gonna talk about a little, uh, little bit about our companies. The cooperative uh, VTCI, or Valley Telephone Cooperative, was formed in the 1950s, and that's really our, our base company, and that's a, uh, a regulated local exchange carrier, our, our, our LEC. And, and basically, the reason the cooperatives were formed, and these were telephone companies, were because they were uh, out there, there was a need to provide phone service to areas where nobody else would serve, you know, like farmers and things like that. And it was because it was uneconomical. You know, the AT&Ts or the other companies wouldn't serve these areas because it, was, it just didn't make sense. It, it was just too much money to, to, be, uh, to place cable out there and serve these customers. So these uh, rural cooperatives were formed. I think in the state of Texas, there's a couple hundred of them and we're one of them. I think we're in the top four or five now in size in the state of Texas. The biggest one is in um, north of San Antonio, it's Guadalupe Valley uh, Telephone Cooperative. Uh, but we've been out there a long time. We've been doing uh, telephony for a long time and uh, data communications for a long time also. And we've progressed with that. We serve a very rural area. We serve a lot of uh, towns you've never heard of unless you've, you're very familiar with the valley. We, uh, our area covers uh, all the way from the Rio Grande Valley, just north of there, all the way to just south of San Antonio. And I'll show you on the map some of our coverage area. So we have uh, about 5,200 voice lines and uh, customers per square mile. We have less than one customer per square mile. Now, in other words, a mile by mile, we have less than one customer. So it's a very rural area, a lot of ranches, a lot of ranch land, stuff like that. What does that mean? It's very expensive to get technology to those customers. It costs a lot of money. So we are subsidized by the government. We get money for that to do that. And that's our regulated side of the business. Very, very heavily regulated. Uh, we have to answer to USDA, FCC, PUC, all these government agencies, USF and stuff like that. How we spend our money and, and how we invest our, our technology. Uh, next company I'll talk about is one of our newer companies, that's VTX Telecom, and that's our CLEC now. It's a competitive local exchange carrier. So it's basically a telephone company, telephone and data communications, that goes into another company's serving area. And you build into their area. So what we did several years ago, we decided to uh, branch out into some territories that are currently served by Verizon. 
And the Verizon territories that we branched out to were adjacent to our current uh, territories, and they were the old GTE territories. Does anybody remember GTE? Got a few people in here, you might remember the old telephone company. So we, we kind of branched out in their areas, and a lot of those areas um, did not even have DSL technology, no broadband at all. Uh, so we went into there. Now we do have some competition from Time Warner in those areas. And where Time Warner gives us some problems are, um, is related to pricing. Sometimes customers will put up with inferior technology just because it's cheaper. Our, our technology is not inferior. I can, I can say that honestly. We do a very good job. We deploy the best we can. But sometimes people are just going to go with what's cheaper and they'll put up with, with, with some problems. And Time Warner is another example. And they're a big company, and they have some advantages over us. OK, so um, that, that area we started, we went overbuilt, and we went 100% fiber to the home within the city limits of these areas. OK? Does everybody understand what fiber to home means? Yes, no? Yes, yes kind of have an idea? Okay, that means we have a fiber infrastructure from our electronics, whether they're in a building or a remote cabinet, all the way to the customer's premise, whether it's a house, whether it's a business or whatever. Now, what's the advantage of that? It's fast. Theoretically, there's no limitation on bandwidth, theoretically. So really, as long as the fiber's there and you put the proper electronics on either, either end, you can go as fast as you want. So we're building. We built the fiber home network for these, these new areas, these CLEC areas. Now, that's within the city limits. And within those same areas, when uh, we go outside the city limits, we went up and we put towers up for our fixed wireless product, our fixed broadband. So we serve those areas with the eventual goal to maybe build out further the fiber home. Okay, so 100% fiber home within the city limits. I think we passed about 15,000 structures on that project, about 15,000. So, and that, that project is, is complete. Uh, and then our third company there is a non-reg business, it's VTX Communications, it also it used to be known as Grande River Technology, uh, not Grande River uh, Communications, so there was confusion, and we changed the name of the company. And that company is our long-haul transport, fixed wireless, or ISP, now, transport, you can compare that to the interstate system on your highways. Okay, you have your highways and everything, and you have your interstate highways. Well, transport business is the interstate. And we do anything from 56K circuits, that's 56K, 56 kilobits per second, all the way up to multiples of 10 gigabits per second on our transport network. Soon to launch 100, 100 gigabits per second. We do, um, we've been doing uh, dense wave division multiplexing for about 15 years, doing that. And what we're able to do is different wavelengths, multiples of 10 gig and a pair of fibers, long haul transport. Been doing that for about 15 years. We've been doing all that kind of stuff. Pretty much any type of technology you've heard about on the transport side, we, we're either doing it today or we've done it in the past. Anything from, again, 56K, basic circuits, TDM, Sonnet, ATM. Never, we did a little frame relay in the past, moved on past that, we do ISDN. Of course, everything now is moving to what? What technology is everything now on the network? Ethernet, Ethernet. Now, who can imagine that a technology that was developed for a local area network is becoming the predominant player in the transport network today? on wide area networks. It's amazing what's happened with Ethernet technology. It was not designed, never intended to be used as a transport technology, but it is being done today. They're making Ethernet look like circuit-based networking. They're putting band-aids and patches on it because they can get so much high speed with it. And it's so, so uh, viable as a transport technology. We also have an ISP, like I said, so we're our, we're our own ISP. We're our uh, ISP, in other words, we connect to the backbone uh, internet, uh, tier one providers at multiple locations, and we are ISP for some external customers. We also, our transport business, we have 70 main transport customers. Um, 
and we also serve uh, many customers or uh, transport companies uh, in Mexico. So we transport traffic in and out of Mexico, primarily voice over IP traffic. And when we have a problem on our network, yeah, the, we get the calls from Mexico City, Guadalajara, stuff like that. And guess who takes those calls? Our network operations center. If we have problems on our network, because it, voice over IP traffic, especially in and out of Mexico, means what? We're losing minutes of use. We're, we're losing income. And they calculate things by minutes and seconds. So if, they, we, if we, our network goes down for 10 minutes, they, they may lose tens of thousands, hundred thousand dollars just because the network's down. So we get those calls in our network operations uh, center. We also have an IPTV product. We've been doing that, mm, I think, since 2006. So we have a TV product, and, we, and it's uh, fully um, dependent on IP technology. It's um, multicast technology, um, MPEG-4, 256-bit encryption. Uh, it's totally protected on our network, a private network, fully firewalled. Uh, so nobody can get to it easily from the internet. And um, I think we're up over 300 channels today. Uh, over 300 channels today. Bandwidth per stream in the real world, not in the lab. Anyway, for a standard definition to get the quality you need, uh, up to four to five megs. And for high definition to get the quality you need on the ESPN, and some of the high quality channels, eight to 10 megs, bursting to those kind of speeds per channel, per channel. So 300 channels, you can do the math. We're, we're, well, uh, we're right at a one gig dedicated uh, TV bandwidth on our backbone, on our transport. Megabits, no bytes, right? Excuse me? You're saying uh, megabits, right? Megabits, yes. Yeah. Did I say bytes? No, I just want to check. Yeah, megabits, yeah, yeah. and. Um, so, so we're there, we're, we're actually have a bottleneck in our uh, provider via Dallas, and we're going to um, uh, get that upgraded to a 10 gig connection so we can add more TV channels. A lot of HD, it's gonna be kind of interesting what happens with 4K uh, TV, you know, what the bandwidth requirements are gonna be for that. MPEG-4 is not gonna cut it for that. There, there are new compression standards coming out for that. But anyway, you have a TV product. TV is very difficult to do, by the way. Uh, I've been doing this since 1976, and it's probably one of the most difficult technologies to do right. Because, why do you think that is? Anybody have any idea? Real time? Hmm? Real time? Okay, if you have a problem, what happens? People see it on their TV, right? Okay, and data communications, data transmission, most protocols have the ability to recover from that. You know, in other words, they do retransmission and ask you to retransmit your packets. TV, you don't really do that. If you have a problem, you see it right then on the screen. And guess what? The people call the help desk. You know, and it doesn't matter whether it's on your network or not. And a lot of times it's not on your network, but they pick up the phone and they start complaining, hey, you know, I get pixelization on my screen or my screen's frozen, that kind of stuff. So it's very challenging. Uh, from a product standpoint, from a technology standpoint. Okay, uh, let's see what I got here. Um, okay, service areas, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit already. I'll show you a map here in a second and it'll be a little bit easier to see. Um, again, uh, the cooperative VTCI was mainly rural communities, very small communities. I think our biggest town is probably Port Mansfield that we serve on the co-op. Uh, some of the communities we, some of the areas we serve don't even have a community, or if they do, maybe 30 people live there. So these are very rural, very spread out. Selec, like I said, these are a, a towns adjacent uh, to our territory that are served by Verizon today, and in some cases, Time Warner is in those areas also. And then uh, the VTXC is our non-reg company, and like I mentioned earlier, um, we, uh, we serve uh, companies into Mexico. We have uh, POPs or point of presence in multiple places uh, um, here in the Rio Grande Valley, um, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, and Corpus Christi, and a few places in between. So we cover, we cover a large territory geographically. You say, well, why aren't we in McAllen, right? Well, maybe one day we will be, at least with our fiber to home when it makes economic sense. Okay, this is kind of our territory. 
these, these areas here, again, here's the Rio Grande Valley, and these little gray shaded areas are our coverage areas for our wireless, fixed wireless broadband product. And uh, you notice we pretty much covered the entire Rio Grande Valley here. We've got some areas here. This is Hebronville. This area's around Corpus, George West Three Rivers, and then some areas just south of San Antonio. This is the I-35 corridor between San Antonio and uh, Laredo. Everybody knows what's going on with the Eagle Ford shell? How many people have been up there recently in that area? It's crazy. Whether you agree with it, the technology or not, the area is just booming. It's just remarkable. And that's really kind of like all in this area right here. These, these blue areas are our co-op territories, which the CELIC, uh, or the uh, cooperative was formed under. These red areas are our new areas that we went into with our fiber home product. And went in, these are the Ver uh, Verizon exchanges. So this is uh, Santa Rosa, Lyford, Sebastian, Raymondville, uh, Falfurius, Premont, um, Aguadulce, um, Orange Grove, George West Three Rivers, and Jordanton and the Charlotte area. So we're kind of in those areas. Now we're not in any of the big metro areas with fiber at home yet, but that doesn't mean we won't be one of these days. We can do it, but the business model hadn't worked yet. Technology-wise, we can do it, but we just hadn't been able to get the, um, the financing right at this time. Okay, this is a, a high level map of our transport network and this is our fiber network, it's a very high level. It does not include um, a lot of our fiber, but you notice we have fiber routes all, all over the place. Uh, go all the way down to Brownsville, Harlingen, Edinburgh, McAllen, we just built a lot of this network here with a grant and a loan. Uh, Rainville, kind of everywhere in between. You notice we go into Laredo here, this is where we connect into Mexico. Uh, we're probably going to branch off into Matamoros here in Brownsville in the near future. Go all the way up to San Antonio, all the way over to Corpus, over to Houston, and we ride, our, uh, we ride other people's networks all the way to Dallas. So the question is, how much uh, capital investment are we talking about? Capital? A lot. <laughs> I'll talk a little, bit about, uh, talk a little bit about the capital in a minute. Yes? I was going to ask uh, about what's the diameter of this fiber optic cable and how much does it cost per yard, I guess, to... Okay, the fiber, the fiber itself, um, the, the largest fiber strands that we put in the ground today, and, then we, and everything we do is 100% buried. We don't put anything in the air because we have hurricanes here, things blow down. Okay, it costs more money that way, but that's the way we do it. Um, they're about this big around the fiber sheaths, and they can be about the largest one has 288 fibers in it, 288. Okay, you so say, well, how much bandwidth can I put in it? And I'll say, give me the le money for electronics, I'll put it as much as you want. Okay? So 288 fiber strands is the largest, but we go as small as two fibers and one sheath for fiber drops, all the way to 288 today and one fiber. This, this new route here from Brownsville through Westaco to Hidalgo is two, two eight, 288s along old military. So it basically varies in price based on the amount of fibers yes. you put in the Yeah, it can be anywhere from less than 50 cents a foot to several dollars a foot. Fiber is cheaper than copper now. Can you believe that? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. And of course, the bandwidth capabilities are, are tremendous compared to copper because copper is, is a you know, valued resource. That's why you see people um, pulling cables down, stealing copper cables because they're reselling it. Yeah. Sometimes they'll mess with our fiber cables thinking it's, it's uh, copper, and that's not a good thing. Okay, so we have a, a very large fiber network, and I'll talk about the number of miles we have here in a second. I'll take it on the next slide. Well, we kind of go a lot of different places. Some of this fiber has been in the ground uh, as long as the late 1980s. Our original backbone is from the 1980s. Now, I wasn't with Valley then, but I was with AT&T, Southwestern Bell, and we started our fiber network in back in the South Texas back in the late 1980s, and as recently as today. And we have fiber projects going on today. So um, the fiber has become less expensive and better quality over the years, yes. Fiber optic was developed by Bell Labs, right? Or yeah, they were one of the key players, uh, Bell Labs, yeah. And that, in fact, when I worked at AT&T, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of people at Bell Labs and uh, when the um, 
Uh, AT&T was broken up into multiple companies. I also had the opportunity to work with the Bell Labs for Southwestern Bell, Pac Bell, and Ameritech. So I worked with the people in Austin. I worked with the people in Pleasanton, California, which were Pac Bell. And I worked with the people in the Chicago Heights area, which was the Ameritech people. Now, they were kind of the, the local Bell Labs. Very interesting things. Uh, I will say this. It's very interesting to work with PhDs from Stanford and places like that and tell them how the real world worked. <laughs> yeah, because they would come up with a lot of good ideas, but it's like, okay, that's just not going to work in the real world. I mean, we can't support that. We can't deploy that. And the customer doesn't really need that. They have great ideas. And, uh, but we... Would you say that it was too far ahead of its time, the ideas? Or how it was just too complicated, too much, you know, they were just, yeah. I mean, I can talk about some stuff. So, uh, uh, there's a lot of stories there, but you know, it's you know, scientists. You got to bring them down to earth sometimes, and you know, and okay, this is something that really makes sense in the real world. It's feasible, in other words. You know, it may be the best technology. It's kind of like the old beta versus VHS argument. You know, beta was better from a technology standpoint, but VHS won for other reasons. Same thing with Ethernet versus token rings, and I'm dating myself again. Okay, so a very big fiber network there, and uh, we do a good job on that. We build a lot of networks, okay? Um, probably talked about some of this already. I kind of do that. Uh, since 2005, which is uh, when I joined Valley Telephone Cooperative, um, I went in for an interview. My uh, CEO, or my, our general manager, was hired by the company a month before I was. Um, I moved to the valley because my late wife was from the valley and I got tired of driving from San Antonio to the valley every weekend, you know, it's like, okay, enough already, you know, the rest stop in Sarita, it's kind of old after a while, right? Um, so uh, I joined, um, I got an interview um, at Valley Telephone and by the time I got home I had a job offer, so uh, it's been a good deal for me, it's been a good company to work for for the most part. Um, a small company, we get to do a lot of cool things. Again, uh, since 2005, we've deployed, a, again, wide-scale fixed wireless. I showed you the tires before. Uh, we were the first company in South Texas, uh, South Texas being San Antonio South, to do fiber to home. Uh, we did it in August 2005, okay? And we did it in an area on uh, FM 649, uh, north of Rio Grande City. And that, that community still has fiber home. Very small subdivision, small community. Um, they still have fiber in the ground, and we've actually upgraded the technology three times since then to newer technology. So we've been doing this a while, and there's been some growing pains. 100% uh, packet-based voice telco switches. Any, anybody know the difference between, anybody familiar with the terms TDM versus packet-based? Heard of TDM, time division multiplexing, things like that? Okay, so we've moved from a time division multiplexing world to a packet-based, which is an IP world typically and we're 100% that. Uh, the rest of the industry is kind of catching up on that. We're 100% already. And uh, of course, our packet-based switches still support TDM technology. Um, DSL, we've been doing DSL since the uh, 1990s. And we currently do some ADSL2 Plus and some VDSL2. VDSL2 uh, will support bandwidth on short loop lengths of 100 megabits per second. and 200 megabits per second, up to that, but very short, uh, very short loop lengths, and that's over copper-based uh, technology. Um, internet backbone, and when I got on with the company, was a one single 45 megabits per second connection in Harlingen. So our ISP to the internet was one 45 meg connection, and now we've got uh, two 10 gigs, four additional one gig, and we're going to add a, another 10 gig. We're about to turn it up. So we've grown quite a bit. I mean, that's just an astronomical growth on the bandwidth usage. We are selling fiber to the home in our SELEC territory. Our standard fiber home package is 50 meg down, 25 meg up. And that is real bandwidth. That's not a farce. That's not made up bandwidth. You are not going to have any bandwidth issues on our network, within our network. That's real bandwidth. Now, once you get out the internet, it's a different thing. We can't control that. But that's true bandwidth, and we sell that 50, 50 down, 25 up. Don't you wish you could get that at your house, right? Yeah, I do too. I need to move. 
We need to move to Ravenville. <laughs> One place. <laughs> I'm thinking about moving myself. Anyway. Uh, IPTV, like I said, was launched in 2006. We have over 9,000 miles of fiber and copper infrastructure underground. So 9,000 miles. It's a lot. Uh, we're retiring some of the copper. We're adding more fiber. Uh, as I speak, uh, we have a big budget for next year for a lot more fiber at home in some of our territories. Uh, we're already working on ordering fiber. Right now, there's a shortage of fiber because everybody is shipping to China right now. Right now, the interval for getting fiber is six to nine months because the demand is very high. Of course, Google's eating a lot of that up, too, you know, in certain areas. So the demand is there. It's the way to go. We've been doing it a while, uh, even though we're small, uh, but we've been doing it. Again, I talked about Network Operations Center. And um, our network, one of the things I really pride myself on is our network, our transport network, is fully redundant, not only on fiber, but on electronics. The only time it's not is because we may have a customer that does not want to pay with the redundancy, does not want to pay for the redundancy. So if we get a fiber cut, and we do, people dig our fiber up, highway department, contractors, and um, you know, we get, it's severed, our network will self-heal. It should heal 100% of the time. And it's rare that we have an issue. Now, sometimes we'll get two fiber cuts in the wrong spot. We had one of those earlier this year. We had a fiber cut south of George West, and the same day, another contractor cut our fiber north of George West. So it isolated the entire community. Now figure that one out, right? The odds of that. So you can't win for losing there, but um, we are fully redundant unless the customer, we do have some customers that ride our network. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of transport customers. AT&T uses our network. Verizon uses our network. Um, let's see who, who uh, T-Mobile uses our network. Who are some of the other cell phone providers? Cricket, some of those, they use our network. So I have a question then, like these small towns like here in South Texas that uh, have this fiber connection, they have like faster internet than people like in Austin and like San Francisco or? Yes sir. Wow. <laughs> Definitely. And some of, them, some of them in their 80s, they don't even know what they have. Yes. <laughs> It's because, because we're a cooperative and we've been very careful with our money and our investments. And we build, we've, we've, uh, we have a, a, some good uh, partnerships that have lent, lent themselves to getting a company a, a lot of money, AT&T being one for their uh, wireless service. And we serve like all the cell towers in our territory, uh, most of them are served by fiber optics. So we go to the cell towers, and so as AT&T tries to upgrade their network, they'll do that. And I'm running out of time, or I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, I mean, I could talk about this quite a bit. Make sure you create it afterwards. Yeah, okay. Um, um, okay, company direction, what are we gonna be doing in the future? Uh, continue to build our network. Um, we developed a major strategic plan with our board of directors in 2005. We recently revised that. Um, one of our Biggest problems is always having the right employees. Um, I hire a lot of people, um, especially local people. I've got people that have a high school education that are some of my best technicians. They have an extremely natural talent for networking, and I can tell real quick. Okay, we have people. I've I, I got a guy who came out of high school. He had two Linux certifications. He did them on his own. Hired him and another guy on the spot. Two guys, one day to the help desk, and now they're by two lead technicians in the, in the company. So you'd, you'd be surprised. We hire on the ability to learn and the ability to work with technology. Yes? How much do people pay for that 50 meg download? <laughs> it's, I can't remember what it is, but I think it's about $50 a month with the voice service also. Is that 15 or 50? 50, yeah. I think it may be a little bit less, but yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And we have a 10 meg package also. Yes? Is that 50 shared? No. Not in our network, it's not shared. Not. To the edge of our network, I can guarantee it today. And you can trust me on that. Yes? Sell these prices if you weren't getting government subsidies. In fact, we didn't even be in business if you didn't. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Is that why you can't sell in big plans like Edinburgh and McAllen? That's one of the reasons. 
because it's more of a, and we do have, we, we have our CLEC and our uh, non-reg business, and they use a regular business model. And our CLEC, we did get government subsidies for that. And I haven't talked about that a little bit, but we did get, but you're exactly right. If we didn't have that, it does, like I said earlier, it doesn't make, it's not economical to build on these rural territories. It's not. I mean, if you, if you just take dollars and cents, does that make sense? I mean, if I got... It should be more economical to build in the big cities, so come here, surely. Yeah. Well, and, and in some cases it is, but we, we've branched out in some of the larger communities, but we just hadn't gotten some of the bigger ones yet. Not to do five at home, anyway. We are in the transport business in these big cities. We are in that. Okay. Am I out of time? I got... Yeah, okay, let's see what I got. I do want to talk about, and that's related to your, your statement up here, the gentleman earlier. Um, we, did, uh, we did apply for a BIP and a BTOP award uh, three or four years ago, broadband stimulus, and uh, the BTOP was the NTIA, and a broadband stimulus was to build out in those uh, territories that were uh, classified as underserved. We wanted now, I'm being honest with you. We wanted to go to McAllen. We wanted to go to Harlingen, but it did not fit the criteria for being a rural community. So we would have not gotten qualified for that. Some people did do that, and they were immediately disqualified by the government. So we went to the towns that were next to us that were underserved and fed the needs, uh, that met the criteria for that. So we got a 49% grant, a 51% uh, self-funded, and that was our CELIC area. And then for our BTOP award, and that was a transport network, and basically we built 200 miles of fiber in the Rio Grande Valley on the transport, and we got that award also. Both those projects are complete. Uh, the bottom project is 100% closed with the government. We've got all the checkoffs uh, for that. And the, the top project, we have some money left, and we're spending that for installs, and we'll be wrapping that project up here uh, pretty soon. And that was a total of $100 million there that we spent a lot of money for the small company that I worked for, um, not, the, not the biggest project I ever worked on. I worked on some $6 billion projects in my previous career. How many people does that serve? How many people? Um, in the, the top one, potential for at least 20,000. 20,000 people. And the bottom one's the transport, so yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking of taking some uh, fiber optic over to the spaceport in Boca Chica Beach? That's actually, actually, we did bid on that, and we lost a bid because we were not the lowest bidder. And I um, understand the company won the bid, it's going to place it in the air. And that's why we lost a bid because we were going buried. Yeah. But we did bid on it. Yeah. I think that's all I have. Yeah. Thank you. I ran out of time. I'll have to say that I'm, I have a customer that's a customer of yours, and I went to this place about an hour and a half out, and they needed a new modem, and I called, and there was a technician there the same day to switch out the modem. That's good. That's good to hear. Compare that to some of our other your competitors. Next week. Yeah. Yeah, and one, one thing uh, I would like to mention, and I wrote a little note here. I mentioned earlier we, we have job openings. Look at our website if you're interested in working for us. Uh, if you're a nerd and you're passionate about technology, it's a good place to be. I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, you're not going to walk in the door with the expertise we need. You're going to walk in the door, if you do, with the ability to develop the expertise we need. Okay, that's why we, we go on. And then the other thing is if you want to come by and visit us in Raymondville, please do. We love visitors. I love showing people what we do and some of the technology. You get to see that cool stuff. Okay, thank you.